Well, today we continue on this path where over the last several weeks we have continued to look at each one of the disciples, each of those who was called to walk with Christ. And, and for some of those, as we have looked, we've looked at people like Andrew and people like, like Peter, who, for whom there are, there are lots of things written. We've talked about uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, of whom nothing is written. Or Matthias, who was the, the disciple that was chosen by the disciples to replace Judas Iscariot. And, and again, there was nothing that's written about him, but there's things to be gained by learning of just who a disciple is. And so today, while, while the, the two disciples we're going to talk about today don't necessarily fall into some of the same categories, how would you feel if your entire life was defined by one act? By one singular act? And here today, we're going to talk about two disciples who happen to share the same name, whose life was defined by one act. You know, you've got, you, you've got the story of Judas Iscariot, and, and you've got the story of Judas, who has four different names throughout Scripture. And so we're going to kind of look at those today, and, and so we're going to start by just looking at some of the Scriptures where these two are talked about, and see... See what this one act is that seems to define both of them. Matthew 10, 3. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first Simon, who was called Peter, Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, uh, the publican. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon of Canaanite, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Mark 3, 16 and 19, these are the twelve he appointed, Simon to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John, together he gave the name Sons of Thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Luke 6, 13, and when it was day, he called unto his, him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles, Simon, who was also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, uh, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also was the traitor. And John doesn't leave him out either. John 14, then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And so today we talk about Judas and Judas. And so we look at these two men who are both somehow defined by one single act. And so there's a lot of questions that come out of this. And so here, let's just look at John chapter 13 the story of Judas Iscariot, for whom we do know a little bit about. Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread I have dipped in the dish. And, and the question is, but Jesus, who of us would betray you? We've walked with you for three years. None of us would do that. And so Jesus dips this piece of bread and he gave it to Judas the sign of Simon Iscariot. And this is, this is like the one and only time in all of Scripture that you don't have Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. You actually have his name. You actually have his given name, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what he needed for the festival or to go to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. And so we have this, this movement that begins to happen, and no one else understands. No one else quite grasps what is going on except for the two who are talking to one another. And this act of what is happening, what happened right before the meal and what is going to happen right after the meal. This one act defines Judas. And so it leaves us with a ton of questions. So who was Judas Iscariot? Well, it's quite interesting that John himself, 
in, in chapter 6, verses 70 and 71, he says that Jesus knew from the beginning what Judas' role was. Now that, that is something that is very difficult for me. Because let's just face it, if, if, if I knew, and I'm going to totally pick on Ryan because he's the associate pastor here and I can get away with it for a little while, if I knew that in, in after eight years of walking together in ministry that Ryan was going to, I don't know, I'll say something that is totally improbable, that Ryan was going to somehow split the church in half and take 75% of you to go worship somewhere else. Now, if I knew that that was going to happen, how likely am I to hire him? <laughs> yeah. Zero. I got zeros. I got thumbs down. People who are responding. Because, because who would do that? Who would intentionally bring someone into their lives for the sole purpose of being hurt by them? And yet, Jesus knew that without this move by Judas, son of Simon, that the plan for human creation could not be fulfilled. And he did it anyway. So was his heart bent towards his desires or God's? We're told over and over throughout the scripture that Simon became kind of the, the banker. Now, I'm not standing here to say that bankers are evil. Okay? I was one. Um, I still have that mind. I still have that understanding. Money in and of itself is not bad. But when you can put money ahead of the will of God, then money becomes your God, becomes your idol, and then is a competitor for the affection that you should have towards God. Now, I, I know that, that many of us can struggle with this from time to time because we can look and we can go, but, but without money, I can't do anything. I can't, I can't have a car. I can't have a home. I can't have, have utilities. I can't have any of that. But what I'm saying is, if you're taking the love of money out of the created order, then you are sinning and you are putting it ahead of God. And, and let's just face it, there's a whole lot of other things that can be put in that place. Food is one of them. I know many people who worship exercise. Now, I do not have that problem. But I know people who do. I know, I know people who, who they get an endorphin rush by jumping out and, and, and running 10 miles. Now, to me, that is, that is the repercussions of sin itself right there. But that is, that is what they do. Now, you know people who have other things in their lives. You know, how many people, how many people struggle with addictions of some kind? You know, they didn't start struggling with addictions because they wanted to be an addict. There is, there is this line... Of, of continuation that leads to addiction. And so we, we, we do that. Things come about that way whenever you get out of order with the things that God has for us for our lives. And the order is, put me first, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek ye first, the scripture says, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I only know it in song form. So anyway, um, so, so then what is Judas's fate? You know, this to me is probably one of the scariest questions in all of humanity, in all of my walk of faith. What is Judas's fate? Do I believe he was created to be sent to hell? And I have a tough time with that. But obviously it says that he is, he is cast into a place where there is gnashing of teeth, where there is a hell, where there is a struggle. And so, so when I'm reading scripture, I have to understand that Judas has a price to pay for his part in, in the death of Christ. We know that from scripture that he goes out and he commits suicide. And I want to tell you something, that, that this, this is a, an old lesson that, that came to me several years ago in the form of a, a book study that I was doing, but, but there is a difference. Um, often you will see in Scripture a juxtaposition between Judas and Peter. 
Now, I know that seems like a big, wild stretch to go from Judas to Peter, but here's the thing. Both of them failed Christ at his deepest needed time. But one of them lived a life of repentance, and one of them lived a life of regret. We are not called to be a people of regret. We're called to be a people of repentance and to hand back to Christ those things that Satan has stolen. And so what happens in, in, in Judas's story is that, that he ends up going out to a field and committing suicide. Now, I don't want to get into all the theological implications of what that is, because there's a lot of people that fall in a lot of different places about that. But let's just say that I believe that God is a justice judge. And I believe God can deal with that far better than my opinions could ever be. And so I will leave that to his. But, but, but Judas faced regret, and regret le led to poor decisions, in my opinion. So now, who was Judas, who after, obviously, all of this takes place, because I'm not so sure I want to be called Judas anymore. And so he goes by Jude, he goes by Thaddeus, and he goes by Labius. Now, we are told in Scripture that he is the brother of James. Now, there are a lot of theologians that believe that he is the brother of James, who is also the brother of Jesus. And so you, can you imagine the identity crisis that this man is going through? Now, there is also a book that is written in his name. The book of Jude, it happens right before Revelation. And if you've never had an opportunity to read it, it is a very interesting read. And we're going to talk about that today because I believe that the book is written by a man who has been hurt by the very name he has been given. And so I think there's a lesson for you and I in that. And so here's, here's what I want to look at. In Jude, where this is the letter that Jude is writing to Christians that he has had the, the honor of bringing the gospel to. <laughs> I love how he starts. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write you about the salvation we share, but I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only Savior and Lord. Now, the book of Judas is very intriguing. And, and if you open it up and you understand that here's a guy who has run from his name for almost his entire ministry, you begin to understand why this guy fights adamantly for truth in the gospel. Because here's a guy whose very name tends to shudder people's thoughts of him. And so I want to look for just a minute. I want to, I want to ask you, because here's the thought that comes out of this for me. What type of... Back up. As a father of an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, I have the ability... And I have the intent of speaking truth into my children's lives. Now, I get to control that truth. Here's what I mean by that. How vulnerable do I want to be in this moment? There was a person in my life, early in my life, that this was the truth they breathed into me. Trey, you are an amazingly capable person. You will be a young man that will change the world. You will do things that I cannot dream of. And you will do things that God will put you up to. And those words came to me from my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather, who was the only pastor in my entire family for generations. He, as I am, was the black sheep of our family. 
And so he, at the age of 30, went from being an alcoholic, abusive husband and father to receiving the grace of Jesus Christ. And he spent the next 67 years sowing grace and love. At 30 years old, after he had thrown every last piece of furniture out of the house in a drunken rage that my grandmother remembers still, the preacher came over to talk to him. And it changed everything for him. And therefore changed everything for me. Now here's another truth that was given to me as a child. There was a person in my life, and this person I will not name, but there was a person in my life that their truth for me to know about myself, that I was a fat, ignorant pansy, and I would never amount to anything. Now, which truth do I want to impart upon my children? Because let's be honest, when we speak to our kids, when we speak to people and we give them names and identity, quite often they live up to it. No matter which direction we go with that. Jude was one such person. This is how he ends this letter of beating up all of these people who are hearing a false gospel, all of the people who are giving a false gospel. And he ends his letter with this statement that I love. It says this. This is his doxology, his, his gift back to God at the closing of this letter. He says, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, to Him be glory and majesty and power and authority through the name of Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Do you think Jude is being delivered from who he was told he was? Because I do. I see a delivery in him that is different from the delivery that, that, that most of us have experienced. Most of us end up living down to the things that we are told we are. But if we, if we are lucky enough to have that one person who pours into us and tells us how great we are, then we can find a way to reach, to reach up, to meet that. Now here's the beautiful part of all of this. It's the song that we opened up with today. Hello, my name is child of the one true king. Those words ought to fill you from deep within and ought to pour out of you with an energy and an excitement that is unlike anything else because you are a child of the one true king. That makes you a prince and a princess that is able to conquer the world in your father's name. I love the excitement in this room. Wow. I, I, last week, I mean, when we were talking about John and we talked about the son of thunder and how we opened up his scripture and he says, in the beginning, God created. And he was a son of thunder. And that's who we have the ability to be because our God is capable of immeasurable things. He is capable of using you and I to change our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents. He is able to use us to change our children, our neighbors, our friends. Not so that we have neighbors and friends and parents and children that we want, but so that they can be the children of God that he wants for them. Because we have the ability to speak truth into people's lives. What truth are you speaking? What is the value of someone's true name? To me, that is the question of this sermon. What is the value of someone's true name? Suzanne, you are a daughter of Yahweh. And you have the ability to conquer life and death. Ramon, you are a son of God Almighty, and the words you speak from this pulpit and in your community have the ability to change people from the inside out. Trina, you are a daughter of the living God, 
And the words you have to speak to your friends and your family and your neighbors can change them. Giving a name is worth everything. What will you be called? Well, I sure tried hard. I gave it my all. I hope they recognized that. How self-focused is that? I hope they recognize what I did. That's not God. I stand and I go, I want them to see my maker. I want them to see the one who forgave me for all the stupid things I've done in my life. I want them to see the one who can forgive them for any stupid things they've done or any stupid things they're going to do. Because our God knows us from the very beginning. He knew what Judas was capable of. He also knew that Judas had a choice. Jude struggled with his name. Because on one hand, his name ties him to the one called betrayer. But, but I think he struggled with his name for another reason than just that. I think he struggled with his name because he is the son of James, the, bro the brother of James, the brother of Jesus. And he doesn't want the betrayer to be tied to his brother. He doesn't want his failures tied to his Lord. But here's the thing, and this is the beautiful thing, and I hope that Jude got this before he, before he died. My God is only made stronger by my failures. Think about that a moment. My God is only made stronger by my failures because this world can't see my power because I ain't got none. I don't have power except the power that God Almighty gives me. That's the only power I've got. And if, if we're looking and we're going to it in, in the second half of this series, we're going to begin to look at a series that I've titled Under Construction. And we're going to look at people in the Old Testament who are total, total goof-ups. I always gained a lot, a lot of encouragement from Noah. Here's why. Noah was chose to save the very existence of humanity. And what does the Bible tell us the first thing he does when he gets off the boat is? He's drunk and naked. <laughs> Goof up. Oops. But God chose him. God chose him not because of what Noah was capable of, but because of what God was capable of. And we're going to look at people like that. And I want you to begin to see that you are also under construction. And if we understand that, that we may never hit perfection this side of, of the kingdom of God. In fact, I'm, I'm quite certain we're not going to. But I can be his son. You can be his son or his daughter. And you can make a difference and you can make an impact. And what I want us to learn out of these stories, what I want us to learn out of each disciple is that we have the ability to leave a legacy. And our legacy does not have to be full of theology and right understanding of God and right understanding of the Bible. Our legacy comes as it did in John chapter 3. I don't know what happened to that guy. But I know this morning he was blind. And this afternoon he isn't. When Jesus healed the blind man, the witness around him was not, well, you know that Jesus is really the Son of God. You know that he came here, he was born of a virgin, and he did, we, none of the right theology is what was spoken in that time. The witnesses said, that dude... He couldn't see the broadside of a barn this morning. But this afternoon, he's reading point four font. 
You know, he's got 20-20 eyesight, and that's only because there was, there was this guy named Jesus that walked. And he said, I want you to see. That's all we got to know. And so what is our legacy? How are we doing with our legacy? I want us to be people who aren't tied to the name that the world tells you you are. Because, Brian, let's get, let's get real honest. Do you want the name that the world calls you? I don't. You know, Lee, I don't. Do you want to be called what the world wants to call you? Buck, do you want to be known for your history? Or do you want to be known for your future? I want to be known for what God's doing for me. And so that's my challenge for you. That's what I leave you with today. Because that's time. The phone rang. It's done. <laughs> I don't know whose phone rang, and I'm so sorry for pointing it out. Ryan, do you have a closing song for us? <laughs> but here's the truth. Here's the truth. The altars, they are open. This is a place you can come, and you can lay before God, and you can lay down your old names. You don't have to be called Simon. You don't have to be called Judas. You don't have to be called... SOB or whatever else you were known for. You can be called a child of God. And you can be his son and his daughter. And you can be known by that, not just here in this place, but around the world. You can be known in your community, by your neighbors, by your family members. I don't know what happened to that dude. He used to be really annoying, and he ain't anymore. That's a testimony. Dale says, that hits close to home. <laughs> so let's, let's open up the altars for prayer because I'm losing it. All right. Um, if you want to come and pray this morning, if you have something that's really weighing you down and you want someone to come and pray with you this morning, over here on this side, these altars, these chairs over here, come over here and somebody will join you and they will pray with you. If this morning you need some time alone, you want to spend some time with God, and you want to accept the name that he has for you. This altar, these row of chairs here, you can come. Nobody will bother you. You can come, and you can talk one-on-one -on -one with God this morning. And you can accept that name that he has for you. But we're going we're gonna to pray real quick. The, the, the worship team is going to sing for you. Um, and if you want to come, this is your time. This is your open place, your open time. Father for calling me yours. Thank you for believing that I was capable of something that I wasn't, but you are. Thank you for calling me to this place in life, this place in ministry. And Father, I thank you for the people that you have placed here this morning to hear this word. I pray that you will speak boldness into them. I pray that you will speak love into them and grace into them. And I pray that when they walk out of this building today, they will have a testimony that says, I once was broken, but now I'm fixed. God, whatever that is that's broken in them, whatever it is in them that you want to fix, may they be known by what you have done in their life, not because of their brokenness, but because of your fixedness. God, speak into lives. May their hearts be open. May our hearts be open to hear from you. God, we give you this space. We give you this time and pray that your spirit will speak directly to our spirits. And may we know that you are here. In the name of Jesus, amen. I think I know why we were uh, not very enthusiastic, Trey, when you spoke that truth to us. I think it's because we were afraid. Um, and I just want to offer you the opportunity to move past that fear. Here's, here's the reason why I'm afraid. Because if I am called to make a change in this world, I'm called to go out and be an agent of change, that means I can't just worship here on Sunday mornings, go home, be with my family, and that's it. That means God's calling me to, to act on it. And I want to challenge you this morning. Um, you've heard the truth about who you are. We can't force anyone other than ourselves to accept it and to act on it. 
And so this morning, as we sing this song, you have to choose whether, if you feel like you're broken, you have to choose whether you want to be mended. Um, and we're going to sing this song very specifically for that reason. If you are wounded, you have to choose to be healed. It doesn't just happen. You choose it. You choose it. You can say, no, I'm comfortable in my brokenness, and uh, Lord, I'm just going to go ahead and keep going the way that I am because I'm comfortable that way. So as we, as we sing this song, I urge any of you who feel like you've been held back by fear for too long, that want this, that desire this, come to the altar. Accept it. Say, God, yes. Jesus, yes. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I want to use my words to encourage and inspire those around me instead of putting them down. Let's do that. Just as I am without one being, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to
sinking in. Just let the words, let the names of God, the names that God has given you, let it sink in for a moment. It's okay to have silence in worship. Before we go, let's take a few moments to accept in silence who God is calling us to be, who he is saying we are. You are. Who are you? Ask God to reveal that to you right now for the next few moments and accept. Father God, we pray that we begin to see this time with you as something not like drinking water, where if I go a couple of days without, I can have a little bit more tomorrow and it will make everything better. Help us to begin to see time with you as the air that we breathe. Father, I live from one breath to the next. I live from one encounter with you to the next because it is in these encounters that I gain strength. It is in these encounters that I gain identity. It is in these encounters that I am forever and utterly changed because of what you say to me. Father, I pray for this gathering of people that they may forever be changed by what you call them by the place that you call them. Father, not for who they are, but for whose they are. May they see themselves as yours and yours alone. To be grown, to be spoken to, to be spoken into, and to be a part of this kingdom, this kingdom that changes people from the inside out. That is not just one day when I die, I'll see this place. But this kingdom that is here and now among us. This kingdom that is part of growing up your people. That is part of changing this world that we're in today. Father, may you forever change us. And because of that, may we forever change the world. As we trust God. As we live like Jesus showed us to, and as we depend on your spirit. May we be world changers because you have changed our world. In the name of Jesus, we pray through the power of your spirit, because you are the one who created all and is in all. May we acknowledge you for now and forever. Amen. You are dismissed.